This is Global Mining News, available worldwide on the internet. Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, online editor and host. I'm getting the feeling that September is arriving early almost. I am just feeling the electricity of our media new year is coming. I can just feel my nervous system starting to perk up a little bit here. We have the Global Mining Symposium only one week away, and that features, I was just counting, I think it's 37 speakers. Two, four, five times one, two, three, four, five, 27 presenters and eight featured speakers. So 27 plus eight, that's 35. We have 35 speakers at the Global Mining Symposium. And you know what? Maybe that makes sense. I mean, it is a Global Mining Symposium. You're not going to have four people there. So that is all happening. Countdown clock says we're seven days and three hours away. So next Tuesday, uh, we are going to be starting this thing. You can register for free at northernminer.com slash GMS2020, or just click on the events button, and it will take you to this page. You can still sponsor. If you are interested, there's a nice big orange button for sponsorship information. And when you go to the Global Mining Symposium page, you will see an overview. You'll see the speakers. You'll see the agenda, details, and contact. So... A lot going on there. We have thought leadership partners, Deloitte, SRK, and TMX. We have a gold sponsor, Orin Resources. We have silver sponsors, New Range Gold, Rail, Veyer, Renforth Resources, Sockerman, and Saul Gold. And we have presenting sponsors, Orcrest, Canada Nickel, Cobalt Blockchain, Golden Arrow, Golden Birch Resources, New Age, Next Gen, Palangig, and Wallbridge. And finally, we have bronze sponsors, the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, Clone Krippenberger, and Mining Matters. I love that charity, actually. They do really great stuff. Check out their Twitter. So that is northernminer.com slash GMS2020, or just click on the events button. And we have a new episode of the Pebble Mine is happening. We also have more info on Rio Tinto, and that's actually going to be the focus of this show so I sort of pieced together some stuff from the internet. Just getting the latest. This thing isn't over. Remember the blasting of the 46,000-year-old site? That feels like months ago. It's not over. There's been a parliamentary committee and questioning, and it just continues. There's a news story yesterday. There's the former CEO. People are wondering how much he is involved, Sam Walsh. Uh, so I what I did is I got the start of Rio Tinto's earnings call, then I, unfortunately, the Australian parliament, they don't have audio or video of the hearing, but I did get a couple of clips off a news report uh, from Sky News, and they had a couple of clips of the parliamentary hearing, and I also found a transcript. So I'm going to read part of that. And just to, I'm not here to hammer down on Rio Tinto and to, you know, voice my righteous indignation. I've already done that. I don't, I don't think we need to continue that uh, week in, week out. But what I do want to do is just update us on this story. No one's trying to score extra points here. I just kind of want to see what's going on. And it's quite interesting. The Rio Tinto executives, uh, Jean-Sébastien Jacques, the CEO, is getting penalized $5 million on his bonus for the destruction of the cave that just came out yesterday. And also Chris Salisbury, who's head of Iron Ore in Australia, he's getting penalized a million dollars. And that sounds like it was done from the board. We're going to take a closer look because I don't think the parliament can do that sort of thing. They don't have the jurisdiction, really, to start telling private companies what they uh, can do, but the board can do that. And so lots to tackle. So I've got a big show coming up. So episode 201, here we are. And next, let's go to Gord Sosinski for our second Mining Minute. And Gord is from 
Petro-Canada Lubricants, and he is going to continue to inform us on really on the best way of really servicing these huge mining machines and gives us a wealth of great information. So let's turn it over to my Mining Minute with Gord Sosinski. Joining us once again is Gord Sosinski, Senior Technical Services Advisor for Petro-Canada Lubricants. And so, Gord, what should our listeners base their engine oil selection on? How should they decide what kind of oil to use? First and foremost, the engine oil selection is slightly more complicated today than it was in the past. You need to check what the OEM requirements are. In the current API categories, you'll need to establish if the engine requires an API CK4 or an API FA4 product. The API is the governing body that establishes what that requirement is. So when you do that, you also want to determine what the OEM viscosity requirements are versus what your ambient temperature conditions are paying particular attention to cold weather months and the shoulder seasons. You also want to check to make sure the product you select meets any OEM specification requirements. Those OEM and specification requirements should be listed on the product technical data sheet from your lubricant supplier. And all of the requirements that you need to find for your equipment are in the owner's manual or available from your OEM. And it should be API licensed and meet those OEM requirements. And your lubricant supplier or your OEM should be able to recommend a suitable lubricant. Okay, and help me out. What is OEM? OEM is Original Equipment Manufacturer. Gotcha. So that's the manufacturer of these machines. So it's actually getting pretty complicated. There's not a one-stop shop for oil. There are pretty specialized oil requirements depending on the machine. Is, Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Um, API will require a certain viscosity grade, such as an API CK4 or an API FA4, and those are performance specifications. Your OEM will require either or one of those. They'll Mm -hmm. also have conditions in their owner's manual that is suggested if you're operating below minus 40, you should use a viscosity of a 0W. If you're operating below minus 25, you should be using a 5W and, and things like that. Let's say people are considering turning to Petro-Canada Lubricants as an oil supplier. How would they get a hold of you? What, what should they do? Is there, should, is there a contact page? Is there a website? We have a website at lubricants.petro-canada.com. And we also have an inquiry toll-free number at 1-866-335-3369. And you can reach us through that, or if you prefer on the web, we actually have product selectors where you can choose mining or off-highway and go in and choose your make and model of equipment, and it'll tell you what the recommendation is. Okay, excellent. Great. Thanks, Gord. And we will see you on next week's Mining Minute. And that is Petro-Canada Lubricants, Gord Sosinski. And if you'd like more information or a link to the website, just check out our show notes. I'm going to have a link in there. And thanks to Petro-Canada Lubricants for sponsoring the show. Now let's turn to the website. Yeah, let's take a, there's a few things to choose from here. We have a lot going on. I thought we'd start with the Rio Tinto story, as that will be the focus of the show. So let's take a look here. This just came out yesterday, and this is from Cecilia Jamasmi of Mining.com. Rio Tinto's top bosses will pay millions of dollars for the destruction of two ancient caves in Australia as the group has decided to cut short-term bonuses of some senior executives following an internal review. Chief Executive Jean-Sébastien Jacques will lose almost $5 million U.S. in bonuses, and the head of the iron ore business, Chris Salisbury, will see his bonus trimmed by at least $1 million U.S. According to an internal report released today, Other managers, not at executive level, might also lose their bonuses, the document says. The board's non-executive directors also agreed to donate 10% of their 2020 director fees to the Klontar Foundation, a non-Aboriginal organization that supports Aboriginal education and employment. So ESG, like the timing for something like this could not be worse. ESG front and center, really, particularly in the mining industry, where... Traditionally, I think miners are seen as the worst offenders, so they actually have to do an even better job than everyone else, I think. I mean, Rio Tinto was putting a billion dollars towards climate initiatives, and that's all just been sort of 
washed away by what they did here with these caves. The Rio Tinto destroyed two rock shelters in the Jukin Gorge in the Pilbara region of Western Australia on May 24th, while carrying out work to expand its iron ore operation. The company proceeded with the blasting, despite having received five separate reports on the significance of the sites, both archaeologically and to the local Puntu Kunti Kurama and Pinikura PKKP people since 2013. And this is also a point of contention. Three mining options that would have avoided damaging the sites were rejected in order to access 8 million tons of high-value ore, Jacques told an Australian parliamentary committee earlier this month. And we're going to have a couple of quotes from that later in the show. The internal review launched in June concluded that Rio Tinto, quote, failed to meet some of its own internal standards and procedures in relation to the responsible management and protection of cultural heritage, end quote. It also found that the company failed its own aspirations in working with indigenous groups. Jacques was due to receive an annual bonus of $3.1 million U.S. and a long-term performance bonus of $1.8 million in 2021. The CEO earned $7.6 million in 2019, including salary, benefits, a bonus, and stock awards, according to Rio Tinto's latest annual report. Now, the response was interesting. Some people thought they should have been fired. The Australian Centre for Corporate Responsibility, which represents institutional investors, so not some fringe group here, said in a statement the review was, quote, highly disappointing and, quote, little more than a public relations exercise. And CEO James Fitzgerald said in the statement, quote, tens of thousands of years of cultural significance get blown up, and all that goes to show for it is $7 million of lost remuneration. He said that was, quote, pocket change for these highly paid executives, end quote, and that Jacques and Niven should lose their job. Now, Simone Niven is the global group executive of corporate relations, and Simone Niven is also being penalized. I think it's $960,000 U.S., if I'm reading this properly. The Australian Council of Superannuation Investors, so a different group, said the review, quote, does not deliver any meaningful accountability, end quote. End quote. An independent, transparent review would have given investors greater confidence that the accountability applied was appropriate and proportionate. People are mad. People are mad. And the chief executive of the Australian Council of Superannuation, Louise Davidson, said, remuneration appears to be the only sanction applied to executives. This raises the question, does the company feel that Four million pounds, about seven million dollars U.S. is the right price for the destruction of cultural heritage. People are furious, as they should be. Rio Tinto said it would add a new social performance function to monitor its approach to community and heritage practices. It also plans to include processes to escalate heritage issues to senior management. Now, what I think they're not saying, and they may not be aware of, is there is a bit of a pattern to Rio Tinto's actions. When you look at, remember the, the Star Diamond property? I think that's in Saskatchewan. Rio Tinto is being taken to court there by the JV partner. There is also the bribery scandal in Guinea where that Sam Walsh and Tom Albanese, and Sam Walsh is the former CEO who we're going to hear about a little bit more at the end of the show, were in close contact with another executive, Alan Davies, over negotiations to pay $10.5 million to a close confidant of the president of Guinea in West Africa. And this is related, I believe, to the Rio Tinto Samandu project in Guinea, which is this massive iron ore project that got shelved. But now that iron ore prices are higher, they are looking at resurrecting it. They have a stake in that. So this is, I think, the bigger problem for Rio Tinto. It shows a pattern uh, and it's a values problem. I think when you add up all of these different, there does seem to be an issue here. So we're going to take a closer look in the final section of the program and just sort of pour over things a little bit. But that is the latest August 24th report from Cecilia Jamazmi.
Continuing on, we have a new episode of The Pebble Mine, Northern Dynasty's stock craters on Trump media reports. Also by Cecilia Jamazmi, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has ordered Northern Dynasty Minerals to craft a plan that would mitigate environmental impact of its proposed pebble copper gold molybdenum mine in Alaska. In a letter dated August 20th to the project's developer, Pebble Limited Partnership, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers said that, quote, mitigation is required for unavoidable adverse impacts to aquatic resources. The document marks a surprise reversal from the U.S. Army Corps' July decision. The regulator cleared at the time the last environmental hurdle for the proposed Pebble mine. The Pebble Partnership, in turn, noted that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers' fresh request did not constitute, quote, delay or pause in the permitting process, adding it would submit a plan, quote, within weeks. My problem with Northern Dynasty is if they showed a little bit more caution and concern, but they really just want to, they're always like, no problem, we're going to just keep pushing it through. And if they just showed a little bit more concern, it might be just a touch less controversial. So the stock price took a huge hit. It's, shares of Northern Dynasty plunged 47%. After media reports said the Trump administration planned to block the pebble mine, despite denials by the company over the weekend, and I believe that was Politico, said that uh, the Trump administration planned to block it. So shares were down 40% at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time after falling as much as 56% at the opening. The approval of the final environmental impact statement for the project was supposed to put an end to the almost two-decade-long permitting process. Doubts on the project surged in early August when U.S. President Donald Trump pledged to hear, quote, both sides of the issue. And this followed a tweet by Donald Jr., which we discussed in an earlier episode. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers issued the order on August 24th, and this came shortly after the Politico report that stated that the Trump administration intended to block the project seems like the communication within the government is all over the place. And Northern Dynasty denies the veracity of the report, saying that the message pushed by the media outlet was, quote, clearly, end quote, an error. Another quote, it was likely made by a rush to publish rather than doing necessary diligence to track down the full story. So they denied the political report, but then it sounds like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers came out after. So... Wires are being crossed, and now Northern Dynasty, which seeks to disprove critics of the development, said that it is doing a advertising and outreach campaign to push for the approval of Pebble, and it is targeted to the Trump administration, the Republican Party, its delegates, and influencers, RNC influencers. <laughs> so isn't that interesting? So again, Northern Dynasty, I think if they were just a little less aggressive, but now they're starting an ad campaign for it. Like maybe that's just how you have to do things in the 21st century in America. But I don't think that's going to really put anybody's fears to rest if they're starting some huge public outreach advertising campaign. But I guess it depends what they say. So there's the latest on the Pebble Mine. Stay tuned for next week's episode, which I'm sure is coming. Moving on, Pacton Gold uses AI to advance projects in Red Lake. And this is by Carl A. Williams, our senior reporter and science reporter. And he is saying that Pacton Gold has been using AI. So I just wanted to highlight that because I thought it was quite interesting. And they are based in the Red Lake area, and I think their project is called the Red Lake Project, so don't get confused there. And there are a few miners in the area, including Battle North Gold, formerly Rubicon Minerals, and Pure Gold Mining and Evolution Mining. So they are working with Windfall Geotech, which is an artificial intelligence specialist company. And with them, Pacton has identified five priority targets including the Karakona East target, where recent reconnaissance drilling hit mineralization of half a meter of 17.2 grams gold per ton, close to surface. And we have a quote from Pacton's CEO, Dale Jin, and he says, 
We used Windfall's cards analysis, which uses artificial intelligence and data mining techniques to identify targets by combining publicly available and private data sets, including geophysical, drilling, and surface data. The algorithm, he adds, is designed to identify areas of interest that are geologically similar to other gold deposits and mineralization in the Red Lake region. So I just wanted to touch on that. I mean, in a sense, it's just another junior drilling, you could say, but the fact that they're using AI is something that definitely turned my head. Now, crossing from Australia to Canada's Red Lake region, now we're going to Africa, where there is a coup in Mali. This is global mining news, after all. And despite the coup, the gold miners are still operating. And you might remember I interviewed I Am Gold's Gord Stothart recently. And we just had B2 Gold's Clive Johnson. And they are in this neck of the woods. Gold miners operating in Mali said they are continuing to operate while monitoring a political crisis that shut the country's borders and hit share prices on August 19th. Malian President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita resigned after being detained by military junta, prompting immediate international criticism despite the group's pledge to shepherd a democratic transition. And this is a very volatile part of the world, West Africa, the new center of a lot of religious extremism. The coup capped weeks of protesting, demanding that he step down. Kaida, 75, has faced opposition criticism for alleged corruption and nepotism within his administration, as well as the mishandling of an escalating Islamist insurgency in the West African nation. B2 Gold, Resolute Mining, Anglo Gold Ashanti, Hummingbird Resources, Roskin Gold and Cora Gold said operations and staff were unaffected, but traders sold shares because of increased political risk. Barrick, the biggest miner in Mali, said its Lulo Gun. Koto mining complex had not been affected by the political situation. And Barrick put out a quote, the complex has an adequate inventory for its foreseeable requirements and management has taken steps to secure its supply lines. Gold operations in the vast landlocked nation are located in the south and west, hundreds of kilometers from the capital, Bamako, where the coup took place. And interestingly, in 2012, when there was a coup, many miners also continued to operate then. And then we have an analyst, Lori Ann Theroux Benoni, a Dakar-based analyst at the Institute for Security Studies. And she told Bloomberg, quote, certainly a country in which there have been two coups in the last decade is not something that reassures mining investors. I would be slightly worried about the level of risk there and especially the rapid change and who are the interlocutors at the level of the Ministry of Mining and the changes in government. Vincent Rouget, an analyst at Control Risk Groups, told Reuters, quote, in the longer term, there are many clouds for mining investors, as this is the second coup in eight years. It will add to an already very high risk premium that people associate with Mali. Meanwhile, I Am Gold had to delay the sale of their Sedola Gold Mine, which is a joint venture with South Africa's Anglo Gold Ashanti, and they have had no luck as they were trying to sell this in the spring and then COVID happened. And so that got delayed and now they got the coup. They had reached a $105 million deal in December to sell their 82% combined stake of Anglo Gold and I Am Golds in the gold project to Australia's Allied Gold. And so on August 19th, we got a development in the story. Colonel Simi Goita declared himself the leader of the military figures behind the coup a group that identifies itself as the National Committee for the Salvation of People, CNSP. And experts believe that the miners in the West and South are unlikely to face any significant threats to their assets. They will, however, deal with disruptions, including the imposition of a nightly curfew and the closure of all Malian borders, according to Alexander Raymaker, senior Africa analyst at V-Risk Maplecroft. So the instability continues in West Africa. It seems to be amped up a little bit. Another thing to look at, and now we're going to shoot back to Canada. The Mining Association of Canada says that a Fed review of Tex Castle project is, quote, political in nature, and this by Canadian Mining Journal staff. And the Mining Association of Canada is weighing in on the federal government's decision to review Tech Resources' proposed Castle Mountain Metallurgical Coal Project in British Columbia, saying that the additional review is unnecessary as the project is already undergoing a rigorous provincial environmental review process 
and accusing the government of making a political decision. Here's a quote from Pierre Graton, president and CEO of the Mining Association of Canada. We are very disheartened by the federal government's decision on the Castle Project, given the expansion fell well below the threshold of being subject to the Impact Assessment Act, IAA. This decision certainly has the potential to lead to longer timelines at a time of unprecedented global economic uncertainty. It seems that this decision was political in nature, as there are many projects across the country with equal or more significant impacts that are not subject to the IAA. This is a case of the government succumbing to pressure from political interest groups while also placating the U.S. government's EPA and the state of Montana. Well, if you're going to affect the state of Montana and they're concerned about it, I don't think it's crazy for the feds to get involved. Um, maybe the issue is that tech just stopped their huge, I think it was the Frontier oil sands project only a few months ago. And it sounded like federal overview may have been delaying that project and may have resulted in that project getting canceled. So maybe the Mining Association of Canada is seeing it happen all over again is, and it's basically saying lay off. Let's see, the Castle Project is adjacent to and just south of Texfording River coal operations in the East Kootenay region of Southeast British Columbia. The expansion would extend the life of the operation by several decades. If development proceeds, Castle would provide all production at Fording River by the early 2030s. In a statement to the Times colonist, tech spokesman called the decision unfortunate and said the project was already proceeding through a rigorous provincial environmental review. So tech can't catch a break from the federal government. So those are your news items. Now let's take a look at metal prices. Turning to metal prices, we'd like to thank mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on August 25th, gold is trading at $1,930.65 per ounce. That is $78 lower than last week's quote and back below $2,000. Silver is at $26.59 per ounce. That is $1.70 lower than last week's quote. Platinum is at $933.34 per ounce. That is $40 lower than last week. And palladium is at $2,163.25. And that is $63 lower than last week. So all the precious metals are down this week. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading 10 cents higher at $2.98 per pound. It was above $3 this week, so copper continues to show strength. Aluminum is unchanged at 78 cents per pound. Lead is a penny higher at 89 cents per pound, showing a lot of strength there too. And nickel is at $6.61 per pound. That is... 15 cents higher than last week, and it continues to be on a total tear. Tin is unchanged at $8.01, and cobalt is back below $15 at $14.99, a penny lower. And zinc continues to show strength, 4 cents higher at $1.11 per pound. So, precious metals pull back. Industrial metals consolidate and show a lot of strength in certain areas. So very interesting moves in the metal markets this week. It really makes you wonder about inflation coming down the pipeline. Let's see. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we're going to take a closer look at the parliamentary inquiry into Rio Tinto's destroying that 46,000 year old archaeological site. So we're going to start. I took the first about six or seven minutes from Rio Tinto's earnings call, and you also get a little taste of how Rio Tinto is doing. What you'll see is about two or three minutes in, Jean-Sébastien Jacques, the CEO, switches over to discussing the 
destruction of the archaeological site. It's quite somber. And what's interesting is if you're actually watching the video, it actually cuts. It's a different video that's spliced in that discusses the archaeological site. I wonder if the first version of this, he was a little too happy because it gets quite somber in the tone, but maybe that's appropriate. See for yourself what you think of it. So we're going to start with that. Then I'm going to play a couple of short clips or about a minute each uh, of the parliamentary inquiry that we had that uh, luckily I got from a news report from Sky News who uh, managed to catch it live because they do show these things live on the Australian Parliament website, but they don't save everything. So luckily someone else did and we just have a minute or two there. And then I have a transcript of that parliamentary inquiry and I'm just going to pick a few things there to look at and just so we get a feel of where this is all going because it's not over. It is not over. And we even have a couple of little news articles that I'm just going to sort of bring up at the end. So I just want to get us updated because it seems like a story that should have disappeared perhaps and it really persists and it, maybe it's even gaining steam. So with that, here is Rio Tinto's Q2, the beginning of Rio Tinto's Q2 earnings call, which was recorded about three weeks ago. Before we talk about our performance, let's start with an overview of how we see the world. We are in unprecedented times, and these times require unprecedented actions. There is absolutely no doubt that during this global health pandemic, our industry has been hit by supply and demand shocks on a scale never seen before. No one has remained in touch on either personal or business level. I am proud of how the team has risen to the challenge to keep our people and communities safe and healthy, to keep serving our customers and to strengthen our financial performance in a highly volatile market. It is about resilience, it is about adaptation, it is about partnership. And against this backdrop, we have delivered a strong and resilient set of results. Rio Tinto generated underlying EBDA of $9.6 billion with a margin of 47% the same as last year. Our return on capital employed is also high at 21%. Our free cash flow was $2.8 billion, impacted by the final payment of $1 billion in the Australian income tax in June 2020 with respect to 2019 profits. Our balance sheet remains strong with $4.8 billion in net debt at the end of the half. We also continue to invest in growth, investing $2.7 billion in our world-class assets. And we return $3.8 billion of cash to our shareholders, taking our total returns to shareholders over the last four and a half years to $38 billion, including the first half dividend of $2.5 billion. This supports our TSR, or total shareholder return of 27%. Our commitment is to deliver superior shareholder value through the cycle. And we have consistently achieved this year after year. As we do this, we also continue to provide wider economic benefits to society at a time when it's needed. In this half, we paid $2.7 billion in corporate taxes and $1.2 billion in royalties. So strong operational performance underpins strong financial performance, as does our commitment to sustainability. Of course, not everything has gone well in this half. We are... We're very sorry for the pain we have caused the Putu, Kunti, Kurama, and Pinikoa people as a result of the destructions of two rock shelters at the Yukan Gorge in the Pilra. I've had the chance to talk to the PKKP direct, to hear from the board and restate my personal apologies. I've also reiterated our absolute commitment to understand and learn so we can make sure that the destruction of site of national significance, like the UK and rock shelters, never occurs again. I've also connected with traditional owner groups across Australia. 
and I've spent time on country with the traditional owners groups in the Cape around our Amron operation in Weeper. As border restrictions ease, I will continue to spend time on country with as many traditional owners as possible. These engagements have provided me with really important opportunities to reflect and hear more from our partners. It is absolutely clear. We must learn from what happened at UCAN. Our immediate focus is our partnership with the PKKP. With this in mind, we have already agreed some action with them to further protect heritage sites on their country, and we are working on further strengthening our relationship. I will appear at the parliamentary inquiry next week to share more on the circumstances around UCAN, our learnings to date, and our views on potential legislative reform measures. Alongside this, we will support and contribute to the planned review of the Heritage Act in WA, Western Australia. The Rio Tinto Board is also conducting a review aimed at improving our heritage processes in Aino. I'm absolutely determined that we all work together as an industry, as governments, and with traditional owners to strike the right balance to enable the development of resources as we protect heritage for current and future generation of Australians. Let me finish this section with an update on safety and health. Our performance has been very strong despite the numerous challenges of coping with COVID. And we have improved our AIFR to 0.37 for the first six months of this year. We had to implement new controls and procedures and use technology in different ways to protect our people and keep our communities safe. Let me give you an example. We are using virtual reality glasses at the OU Togoi underground project so that all teams can inspect the work outside from their homes. The focus on mental health is even more essential in this environment and we are supporting the well-being of our teams. We have introduced LinkedIn online learnings with more than 8,000 employees now enrolled. It is absolutely vital we continue to care for our employees and communities. As you can see, we once again deliver strong operating cash flows of $5.6 billion dollars with a 47% underlying EBDA margin and a return on capital employee of 21%. We spent $2.7 billion on sustaining our world-class operations and growing the business for the future. We increased leverage on the balance sheet by $1.2 billion in the half, as we paid out $3.6 billion in dividends and completed the final $200 million in our buyback program. This program, you may remember, started with a $500 million buyback in 2017. We have now completed a total of $9 billion in buybacks. Today, we announced an interim dividend of $2.5 billion, representing 53% of underlying earnings, which is in line with our shareholder return policy. We have one of the strongest balance sheets in the sector. These provide us with resilience and agility, which is absolutely vital in an increasingly complex world. So, we are well positioned for ongoing success. So, that was the introduction to the 2020 Q2 earnings call. Again, it was about three weeks ago. And now we're going to turn to the parliamentary hearing. And we are going to listen to a couple of audio clips that we managed to get before we turn to the transcript. Mr. Jacques, has anyone been dismissed or counseled for their actions, involvement in regards to this matter thus far at Rio? Thank you for the question, Senator. It is a complex issue. Um, as we explained our solution, it, did, um, it covers 17 years. Many people are being involved. Um, the review are on the way, including the, this inquiry we, which we participate to. There is not one single person which had uh, the accountability for this uh, situation. Um, that's where we are at this point in time, Senator. When were the PKKP made aware that there were four options being considered? So as per our submission is the PKKP was not made aware that four options were available in 2012-2013. And at the relevant meeting in 2013, only one option was presented to the PKKP. And that was the basis of the submission to the Section 18. So that's a key area there that there were four options as to how to deal with this area. 
and only one of them included destroying the Aboriginal site. Now, the PKKP is the Aboriginal group, and so the question was, was did Rio Tinto present all four options to the Aboriginal group, the PKKP, and Jean-Sébastien Jacques is saying, no, we only presented the one option, which included destroying the site. So interesting audio. You see the kind of lack of accountability at the start. There's no one in charge. No one's dismissed. Now let's take a look at the transcript. I don't want to, this thing is long. I'm just going to take a few parts of it because it's also just helps color what's going on here and what kind of questions are being asked. After an introductory statement, Senator Dodson, who is from the Australian Parliament, he says, Mr. Jacques, when did you first become aware of the significance of the Jukin sites? Mr. Jacques, I was made aware of the significance of the site on the Sunday evening on Sunday, the 24th of May. Senator Dodson, so of all the other activities that were going on, you were not appraised of those matters. Mr. Jacques, the first time I was aware of a potential issue at Brockman 4 was on the Thursday evening, 21st of May. Prior to that date, I am not aware of it at all. Senator Dodson, what did you do once you became aware of the significance of the site and the concerns of the PKKP? Mr. Jacques, let me give you the sequence on the Thursday. Senator Dodson, no, just answer the question, please. What did you do? Mr. Jacques, we as a company have reached out to the PKKP to express our apologies, and we have put in place an additional series of actions to make sure that Senator Dodson, I'm sorry, sir, that is not the question. The question is, what did you do once you became aware of the significance of this site to the PKKP people? Mr. Jacques, I reached out right away to Chris Salisbury, who is the head of iron ore in Australia. I reached out right away to Chris Salisbury in order that we agree on the way forward. In order to, as I said, Senator, first of all, to apologize to the PKKP in order to rebuild the relationship and to agree on the way forward. Senator Dodson, were you ever in contact with the federal minister's office? Mr. Jacques, as far as I'm concerned, I had contact with the federal minister after the incident, the week after, but the company, our colleagues in Perth, had contact with the ministries either at state or federal level, and I'm happy for Brad Haynes to explain to you what I was doing that week. So I guess the important part of this beginning is Mr. Jacques, the CEO, Jean-Sébastien Jacques, is saying that he wasn't made aware of the significance of the site until Sunday evening on Sunday, the 24th of May. Now, we saw in earlier report, I believe it was our mining.com report that we had from Cecilia Jamasmi, didn't we see that it was five times that they had been notified? Let's turn to that. So here we are, the company, so this is Cecilia Jamasmi's report. The company proceeded with the blasting despite having received five separate reports on the significance of the sites, both archeologically and to the PKK people since 2013. So there seems to be a discrepancy there. Maybe it is simply, there's a slight shift in meaning, different emphasis that Mr. Jacques is answering to, but uh, there seems to be an inconsistency there. Now, he might be answering, I was made aware of the significance of the explosion on the 24th of May and not talking about the significance of the site. You see, words are very slippery. Now, he followed that first statement by saying, and that probably was what he was referring to, is the significance of the explosion. That was first brought to his attention on 24th of May. And then Senator Dobson said, so of all other activities that were going on, you were not appraised of those matters. And then Mr. Jacques says, the first time I was aware of a potential issue at Brockman 4 was on the Thursday evening, the 21st of May. Prior to that date, I was not aware of it at all. 
And then you see Senator Dodson says, what did you do once you became aware of the significance of the site and the concerns of the PKKP? And then Mr. Jacques begins, let me give you the sequence on the Thursday. No, just answer the question. What did you do? And then Mr. Jacques does a bit of a dodge. We as a company have reached out to the PKKP to express our apologies. And we have put in place an additional series of actions to make sure that, I'm sorry, sir, that is not the question. The question is, what did you do once you became aware of the significance of the site to the PKK people? And then he says, well, we reached out and we apologized. I reached out right away to Chris Salisbury in order that we agree on the way forward in order to, as I said, send her first of all to apologize and so on. So that is the first thing. And then we have Senator Canavan. And Senator Canavan says, is bringing up the four options issue. Senator Canavan says, I will first ask some questions about the decision to choose option four, the one to blow up the site. My understanding from your submission is that four options were considered for the mine design, and I believe it was only option four that impact the Jukin one and two sites. I believe your submission indicates that that option was chosen given the higher grade ore that was in the vicinity. Can you outline how much higher the quality was here? What was the iron content of that area related to other areas of the mine? And how much extra economic value was there for Rio to proceed with option four compared to the other options? Mr. Jacques, the difference between option four and the three other options was of 8 million tons of high grade iron ore. The economic value at the time of the decision was around $135 million of net present value at the time of the decision. Senator Canavan, thank you very much for that. That's very clear and very direct. So we're going to link to the whole report, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of a taste and a flavor. And those seem to be two of the biggest issues. When was the CEO aware of the significance? Because the underlying question of that is, did you do it knowingly? Right. And he kind of dodged it. It looked like it kind of like if you look at that transcript, which we went over twice, it seemed like he was trying to say that he wasn't really aware of it. So that's the first area, which seems a bit of a stretch, but it's the answer that he gave. And then the second part deals with the four options and only one being to blow up the sites. And he said that there was an economic benefit to the one where they blew it up. So that's what we have from the transcript. Now I just want to tackle a couple of articles because Sam Walsh, who is Rio Tinto's former CEO and rival to Jean-Sébastien Jacques, he's also in the news and he's kind of being brought into this. So this is the Australian Financial Review and they have an article entitled Sam Walsh rebuffs request to appear before Rio blast inquiry. So the parliament asked him to show up and he said, there's no point. And he has a quote, it is my strong view that the inquiry should focus on what happened in 2020, not, not what happened in 2013. Mr. Walsh said last week that he issued instructions post the 2013 approval, not to mine the gorge for iron ore, but it was missing from the Rio submission, even though it covers events at that time. Perth-based Mr. Walsh recalls issuing the no mining instructions shortly after Rio was granted permission to mine the gorge under Section 18 of Western Australia's Aboriginal Heritage Act. And then the article says, although Mr. Walsh has referred to 2013 in his recollection of events, the approval was not granted until December 31st that year. So the plot thickens. You see how deep this gets. And Sam Walsh, the former CEO, is really trying to distance himself from the scandal, but there seems to be inconsistencies in his story as well. Finally, we have a piece also from the Australian Financial Review, which is really on top of this story. Sam Walsh loses Juke and Gorge alibi, and this came out on August 23rd. On the eve of his successor Jean-Sébastien Jacques' appearance before the parliamentary inquiry into Rio Tinto's destruction of Juke and Gorge, the miner's former CEO, Sam Walsh, sensationally claimed, quote, that I issued instructions that it was not to be mined. And it says here in this article further down that Section 18 approval was not received until December 31st, 2013. 
So if Walsh gave his instructions shortly after that, he gave them in 2014. Yet Walsh had moved to London as group CEO 12 months earlier in January 2013 and appointed Andrew Harding to replace him as Rio's iron ore chief in February 2013. And so this article is starting to question this whole idea of Sam Walsh when he says, it is my strong view that the inquiry should focus on what happened in 2020, not on what happened in 2013. Joe Aston, the columnist here, continues, his self-serving, needless intervention, referring to Sam Walsh, aided Jacques beautifully in diverting the committee's attention from what happened at Rio Tinto between 2018 and 2020, which is when management was formally advised that Jukin Gorge was of, quote, the highest archaeological significance in Australia, but blew it up anyway. We get it. Walsh has a score to settle with Jacques, who egregiously implicated him in obscure corruption allegations that four years later, Rio Tinto still cannot explain, possibly because they were orchestrated as a purge of Jacques' rivals from the company. But with Jacques now teetering on a precipice, Walsh has inadvertently lent him solid ground. If only he'd kept his colossal ego in check and let the inquiry do its job, which thankfully ain't finished yet. And that really is where we're going to stop on this. This thing is not finished, and it's just a company like Rio Tinto seems to have a lot of skeletons in the closet just from a perception point of view. I don't know the reality on these things, but it sure looks like they have a lot of skeletons in the closet. And now the more light that's get shone on this situation, the more questions that come out, and they are really in the spotlight right now. So anyways, so I hope you did enjoy this special episode, episode 201, where we take a closer look at what's going on in Rio Tinto. And unfortunately, we didn't have one clean thing, uh, one clean interview, one clean statement. We had to go around a bit, but I think it was worth it. And that's just sometimes how you got to get to the story is you got to move around a bit and you got to be flexible. So with that, I hope you enjoyed the program. And don't forget, next week, we've got the Global Mining Symposium. So sign up today. It's northernminer.com slash GMS 2020. Registration is free and we will see you there. Until next time, take care.